to humans, wake up, wise up, do what you can individually and together. I need to record this reaction. I'm sorry. This is insane. You look like a totally different person. I'm just in sh the the entire time that I have known you, which I think is going on like five years, maybe more. I've never seen your face. <laughs> like it's always been covered by a very, albeit beautiful, um, full beard, and you are just yep. like. <laughs> what did Rowan think? What does Miranda think? Rowan was like, I think, a little flabbergasted yeah. and was like, you should grow that back as soon as possible. <laughs> Hit you right where it hurts. Kids are so brutal. <laughs> oh no. Uh, and he was just looking at me weird, like Yeah, you know. He's like, who's my dad? You're yeah. not my dad. Uh-huh. I don't blame um, him. You really, truly look like a completely different person. But uh, it totally worked. No COVID. <laughs> Great. You know, which, like, it kind of feels like a miracle to get on an airplane, like, twice and not have COVID, not contract COVID at this stage. <laughs> Travel right now gives me so much anxiety. <laughs> I don't envy any of you guys. I'm, I'm, any travel I'm doing is a car um and by myself I, i'm not i don't think i'm gonna get on a plane anytime soon like I mean, like that's one of the core sort of like positive things of of covid right is that it's reduced like plane, yeah. plane travel right yeah like is uh but yeah i mean at the same time we flew three days ago you know mm -hmm. or four days ago we had like an hour and a half layover in the airport and of course it's like the airport is even scarier than the airplane right so you know and like the whole trip is a 10 to 12 hour trip with like two flights and a layover in one airport. And we were like mask on all the time in the airport. And then on the airplane, we would like pull it down to like take a few drip drinks of water and like, that's mm -hmm. it, you know? Mm -hmm. So it was, it's like an intense experience, you know, because it's like, you're so hyper-conscious of like that mask being well fit on your face the whole time. And then every other, like, Miranda was like sitting next to this person who was wearing a mask like over a big beard and was like coughing the whole time. <laughs> oh, physically that hurt me. Ugh, I can't. Right? But like we didn't get COVID somehow. So <laughs> somehow that's great. <laughs> oh, it's just anxiety overload. Like I, yeah. I can't do it. There's, and there's so many people that are unmasked, you know, just out and about, just like free balling it. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Um, hey, Matt. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like we just start all our episodes with like a COVID update, I guess these days. That's, COVID I mean, it's important. It really, I know. Like it's, it's crazy. It's super timely. And I, I think we should do, you know, we had a great episode, a couple, a few episodes back um, about like zoonotic diseases and mm -hmm. COVID-19 kind of at the start. So, you know, I think it would be a, a good idea to maybe revisit COVID for sure, you know, as a full episode on the, on the podcast. So yeah, maybe, um, listeners keep an ear out for that in the coming weeks, but, um, Matt Podolsky, thank you for, um, producing today's episode of the show, which I'm super duper excited to talk to you about. Um, on the Earth to Humans podcast. My name is Serena Simons, senior producer on the show. And maybe you can just start by like introducing how you found out about Mark and, um, you know, his, his books and his work. And, you know, you kind of, you kind of get a sense as you're interviewing, but just like how mind blowing some of this shit is. Yeah, for sure. Right. We're sort of discussing two books that he's written um, in, in the episode. The first one is a book he wrote like 10 or so years ago called Conservation Refugees. And then the second one is is a book that he published much more recently um, called The Haida Gwaii Lesson. Um, and I mean, I found out about his book Conservation Refugees because like when, when the pandemic hit, I kind of like took this deep dive into like the history of the conservation movement and like produced some podcast episodes about it and started like developing these kind of larger ideas for um, 
like a bigger sort of documentary story, which I'm still sort of not entirely certain, like what will come out of that. But um, I wanted to kind of record some interviews as I went. And I thought some of these conversations would be really awesome for the Earth to Humans audience. So I recorded this conversation with with Mark uh, last year. You sent me uh, your interview of this episode. And first of all, I love his personality. He's like kind of sassy. (laughs) Totally. Right. You know, and um, he's just he's just kind of like like he knows how to sniff out a story. I guess what I'm trying to say, like he has a really good intuition. for that. Yeah. And he's got this kind of like. Uh, old school investigative reporter attitude, right? He's retired and he was just inspired by uh, just kind of an offhand conversation that he had um, with someone at this environmental conference to take this deep dive into the history of the conservation movement and specifically the history of like how the conservation movement has dispossessed uh, indigenous people all across the globe. And I was very much aware of certain like historic incidents of displacement, right? I mean, we did an interview a while back with um, with with another historian uh, named Mark David Spence. He wrote uh, a book and, and did a whole bunch of research on the dispossession of indigenous people from Yosemite National Park and Glacier National Park and Yellowstone. And so I was familiar with that history at the inception of like the the sort of idea our, our sort of modern conception of the idea of protected land. But I did not have the understanding that like that had continued for over a hundred years beyond that point and that it was still going on now. Yeah. So like the, the international scope of it. And I mean, he didn't realize that either. Like when he first delved into it, I mean, like when I asked him what surprised him most, I mean, that was his answer is like how pervasive this was. And the fact that it happened on six continents and that every single story is really similar, you know? Yeah. I mean, when you, when you frame it that way and you sort of start to think about it, it's this almost like weirdly calculated, strategic, racialized, like decisions that get made under the guise of conservation on this scale that I can't even like fathom and think about. And yeah, like that, this is a a modern thing that like this is not an like an old school like antiquated process you know this is happening right now today and i guess when he said it in those terms i was just like damn i i i don't know Th- that was very shocking to me for sure and um, it's also it, it is even though it's it is happening and has happened on every continent it is also a very american idea Right. Um, And so he talks a lot in in his book, Conservation Refugees, he talks a lot about um, the big five transnational environmental nonprofit organizations. Um, And they're all based in the United States. They're all headquartered in Washington, D.C., all five of them. So it's like it's going on everywhere, but it really just in in a lot of ways, it is just an extension of that original conception of what we think protected land here in America should be. It hasn't changed. It's like we want to think that that's changed, but it hasn't changed. We're still protecting land to create these landscapes that have no humans in them that rich white people can enjoy on vacation. You know, we've been talking a lot about this book, Conservation Refugees, which Mark wrote, you know, 10 or so years ago. But the the more recent book, um, which is called The Haida Gwaii Lesson, was sort of the book that he wrote in response to many of the things that he learned through his investigations and work on the Conservation Refugees book. Wherever he went, indigenous people were asking him about the Haida. And 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 he, and he was like, oh, I, I don't know. Like, I haven't been there. I hadn't, hadn't done that research. But it was like this lingering question that he ought, like wanted to come back to and explore. Like, why is it that indigenous people all over the world 
are looking to the Haida um, and trying to emulate what they achieved. So, you know, not only do you get this awesome episode, but we continue this conversation through our brand new Earth to Humans book club, which I'm really, really excited. This is going to be kind of our our first meetup, you know, as the Earth to Humans book club. And so everyone who is a Patreon subscriber at the the minimum tier, which is $1 a month, um, will get access to our book club. And the book club means for, for this episode and for this book that you will actually get a digital copy of the book. And you're going to be um, invited to a really intimate conversation um, with the author where, you know, our producers will kind of facilitate some dialogue and maybe have some time for Q&A. And so I, you know, I, I think it'll allow you to kind of dive in deep to what we're really talking about and then go even further with us. So we're really, really excited about this. Yeah, for sure. I think it's going to be super awesome to like be able to like hear some of the questions that um, that listeners have and and, and folks for sure yeah, like what came up for you definitely. And I'm also just curious to like you know engage in a discussion about yeah. This. Like, we want these, to meet you guys. Yeah, and like these <laughs> issues are so fascinating. Obviously, like Serena, you and I love just kind of going off on these tangents. And, oh, like, we could go forever. We, totally and right. Um, and it, I think it'll just be super awesome to like invite um, some of our listeners in to, to participate in that. Absolutely. So that is your cue to go run and subscribe to our Patreon. For sure. And there is a link to uh, subscribe to our Patreon in the show description on whatever podcast app you are using right now. So no excuses. Yeah. well um matt thank you so much for this conversation super enlightening um can't wait to chat with mark um in a couple weeks for our inaugural book club meetup for the earth to humans podcast subscribers will get you know all the info um that they'll need to access um the link and we'll let everyone know ahead of time when it's happening so you can put it on your calendars um and schedule ahead of time and um, yeah, just thanks for thanks for bringing us this episode. Super, super cool info. I now describe myself as an investigative historian um, because the last four books I've written um, have been investigative histories. And an investigative history is a, is, is a revisionist history um, where the revision itself is driven by investigative techniques. So I use the skills I learned as an investigative journalist to go back into periods of history that I believe have been um, inaccurately recorded and reported um, and investigate uh, um, institutions and documents and uh, correspondences and everything that we do in that period and basically rewrite the history. So so basically what I went went back and did and, and re- was research the history, of the, the, um, a century long history of global conservation um, on the planet um, and with an emphasis on how it was affecting um, Native people around the world. Um, so it, it became um, a revisionist history of conservation uh, combined with a history of, of uh, Native displacement um, on the planet, which was going on throughout the entire century, but mostly for um, extractive reasons rather than conservation. So to put the conservation overlay on it um, gave it a new a new purpose really um, in terms of recording history. So most history is self-generated mythology. Um, wealthy institutions like conservation organizations basically write their own history. 
um, they pay for it. Um, they, the, the same people that uh, provide them grants, provide grants to the historians that write their history. As a consequence, the history is not entirely accurate. So investigative history is an attempt to make history more accurate. And that's what I do. So, so you're trained as an investigative journalist, right? Like, where did this interest in, you know, this, this idea of, of what you call investigative history come from? Oh, I, you know, investigative reporters get old. Um, and in, in the process, um, we start to discover that our material turns up um, in history. Um, it, first of all, as footnotes, um, and then as um, occasional references, and then as maybe a chapter in a history book. And eventually we realized that we have been uh, uh, providing a lot of material over our careers and our lives um, to the generation of history. Um, so we take an interest in history. We take an interest in that process of, of, of media being um, the, the, uh, the stomping ground of historians. I mean, historians working on something, they'll go into a town, the first place they'll look is in the morgue of a newspaper um, or uh, some kind of media background. Well, and that's where they find our stuff. So um, I then started doing my own histories. Um, always been interested in history, I was a history major. Um, and so, but, but I used my own techniques um, to do histories. And I went back and looked at, uh, at, first of all, at some of the things that other people had used my historical data on and then started new stuff myself. Um, so it was, it was a combination of just, you know, the intellectual challenge of uh, researching history with investigative techniques and the fact that I saw a lot of history um, that was not being completely or properly uh, covered and reported by historians. You know, you, you mentioned uh, this this thing that happens about how investigative reporters, like their work becomes a part of history um, and, and you how you started to experience that. I wonder if you have like a story or an anecdote associated with uh, this this story you broke, right? I mean, you you broke, you are like somewhat famous for breaking this story about the Ford Pinto back in the 70s, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't consider that. Um, uh, I would not consider that investigative history yet, um, because it was really I was reporting pretty much what was going on. Um, the, the the Ford Pinto, when I got onto the story, had been uh, blowing up in rear end collisions, and I had a beer one night with a uh, um, a reconstruction engineer um, who had just reconstructed an accident involving a Ford Pinto that blew up burned one of the people badly in the in the and i said so who was at fault that which driver was at fault because that's usually what um what accident reconstructors are doing they're trying to find fault and he said neither driver was at fault the manufacturer was at fault and i my investigative ears perked up and um and and i said what do you mean he said well ford motor company put a very dangerous car on the road they did it they did it knowingly and uh that's why that car blew up and that's why a lot of cars have been blowing up around the country. So that basically opened my eyes and opened my investigation um, into the history of the Ford Pinto. Um, and uh, I mean, it's, this work always comes from tips um, and often, often received in bars. <laughs> um, and uh, so, and that's, that's it. That's, you picked an example and that's how that happened. Uh, there, uh, and one story tends to lead to another. Um, the Ford, Ford story has led to a bunch of other work I've done on, on the whole business, for example, of placing a dollar value on human life and cost benefit analysis, which is a very common um, corporate practice. Um, and um, so, and uh, on and on and on from there. Sure, 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 sure. So I, I wonder how you, first got the idea or how you first became interested in the revisionist history in your book, Conservation Refugees, right? This, this history, this revisionist history of the conservation movement that you mentioned. Where did that, yeah, like how did that, did that, did that one stem from a conversation in a bar as well? Well, it wasn't in a bar. It was in a conference. I was speaking in, at, in Ottawa, Canada, um, at a, um, it was a conference with a lot of native people in it. Um, it was 
it was, it was a conference that it was about environmental uh, issues, not about native issues, but there were a lot of natives there. And one of them just sort of leaned over my shoulder and said, um, do you know anything about all of these native people that are being displaced by conservation? Although this was a, a lot of conservation people were at this conference because it was it was an environmental conference. And and I said, no, tell me about it. And she she was a Cherokee, uh, American Cherokee uh, uh, native. And and so she started telling me that people all around the world um, had for a century or more um, been displaced in the interest of conservation. So again, uh, my investigative historical ears perked up and that book is the is a consequence. Um, so that's how, you know, it was just a tip. Somebody said, and she had, she actually used the words conservation refugees in our um, conversation. So I just uh, asked her if she had uh, uh, reserved or protected the title and she said no, so I used it. I, I mean, that book is, I guess I would say for, for myself as somebody who, you know, like my entire career has been, I would say in the field of conservation, right? And I, I had already started like doing some research in, into this this conflict that that exists between indigenous nations and indigenous people and, uh, you know, governments and international NGOs that are working to establish protected areas. Um, I, I, I had some awareness of that issue, but the amount of depth that your book went into and the, the scale and the scope of these forced removals all over the planet over the course of this hundred plus year period of time was, I mean, like revelatory for me as somebody who's worked in this field, you know, for 15 years, uh, you know, it, it, it makes me feel like, you know, I, I, I have the feeling, you know, after reading your book of like, you know, I thought I was helping these issues and I, I probably wasn't. You know, and 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 I just like I, I wonder what that process was like for you. I mean, was is this sort of like is this normal for you? You're like, oh, I've written these revisionist a few of these re revisionist histories before, and like I'm used to the investigative, like reporting process, and this is just what happens when you dive into into an issue. Like you find out all of these crazy things that have sort of been hidden from like mainstream society and, and culture. Um, like I, I don't, I'm just I'm just curious, like any sort of insight or anecdotes you have about what that process looked like? Well, the, of all of the, the investigative histories that I've done, this is unique. And it's in one way. Um, and it's unique because unlike other stories that I've done as an investigative reporter, as an investigative historian, they're always a good, good guy versus bad guy story. There's black hats are obvious. The white hats are obvious. In this case, this is good guy versus good guy story. I mean, what you've been doing all your life is 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 laudatory. I mean, you've been working on conservation, and and uh, um, I I respect anybody um, who is doing anything um, on behalf of uh, biological conservation. Um, and any any sort of uh, work in that field is laudatory. You are good guys. Um, you just got one thing wrong in the process, and that was the notion that people who were living off land that was protected um, were somehow damaging the biological diversity of the land. It's just wrong. Um, I don't know. I don't know whether that observation was motivated by racism. I don't know whether it was motivated by uh, bad science. I don't know whether it was motivated by um, anything else. But the, the fact of the matter is, you made a big mistake. Conservation made a big mistake by, uh, in the in the process of creating all these protected areas around the planet, 120,000 of them now. You de you defined a protected area um, as something that was biologically pristine, um, that didn't have humans living on it, that didn't have humans hunting on it, that didn't have humans intersecting in any way. Um, with the ecosystems uh, in the protected areas. Uh, when in fact, most of the areas that conservation isolated and chose to protect were biologically diverse because the people who've been living on them knew what they were doing and were just as interested in biological diversity as the conservationists. 
And it took 100 years, really 100 years and a book or two, but for conservation to realize that that was true, that that ecological knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge, which is designed to protect the the biological diversity of an ecosystem, which translates into food security for the people that are doing it, that that knowledge um, is very, very similar um, to school book biological science, school book wildlife biology. And it's just done in a different text, in a different language. But if, 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 if conservationists had taken the time to travel around with people who can't read and write, but really know their ecosystems well, um, they would realize that, that, that basically traditional ecological knowledge is the same science that they studied in college. Did any of this surprise you? I mean, as you're sort of learning these things, like was like was there was there ever a moment where you were absolutely shocked by like a piece of information you found in, as a, as a part of this research? Like, what was most sort of shocking or appalling to you as you were going through this process? Well, I, I mean, I think there were a lot of things, uh, Matt. I think that um, I was shocked at how long it took um, conservationists to get it. Um, I was shocked that that whole model of conservation was effectively sold to the funding community, that being not just um, government agencies that were responsible for fund and the IUCN um, and all of the, but also the, the private foundations that were funding what I consider to be a bad um, or misinformed conservation science. Um, and it just took them a lot longer than I would have expected. Um, and, and it was so global um, and so universal. I, I, spent time, I spent four years work, working in that book. I was on every continent but Antarctica, and it, it, it was not different at all. At first, I thought it was just Africa, you know, where the colonials went in and just said, you know, screw the natives, we're going to hunt, hunt the wildlife. And, you know, that was part of it. Um, and uh, we're going to do our own farming and, um, and everything. But, you know, it was worldwide, and it was very, very consistent um, in its abuse um, throughout the world. So, you know, I, I didn't use the word um, race or racism at all um, in, the, in the writing or uh, research of that book. Um, but I can tell you this, that, um, that way over 98% of the people who've been displaced in the planet um, in the interest of conservation have been people of color, way over 90% of the people who've been granted in holdings in uh, public land when they were, when public land was created around the world, the people who were granted in holdings while everyone else was not were white people. So call it what you will. Um, it looks like racism to me. And, um, but when it's that obvious, you don't have to say it, do you? <laughs> You take aim, and I think rightfully so, at what you and lots of people call the bingos, right? The big five, these big five international conservation NGOs. Hearing you say that, you know, this book, you, you, you sort of see this book as like the good guys against the good guys. Like after reading this book, I would struggle to view any of those big transnational NGOs as good guys. I mean, I see that there's a transition that's taking place and and that transition surely has progressed significantly in the 10 or 12 years since your book was published um but i mean you go into like really in-depth detail about like some of the specifics of how these issues played out and and how specific representatives from some of these large organizations like had access to the information and should have been able to make a just decision for all the people involved and, and did it, right? Like they made the decision that, you know, looking at it from the outside looks really crystal clear that it was made like because of money, right? Um, so I, I don't know, I'm just, I'm just curious about that because, you know, you sort of frame this as good guy versus good guy. And I, it's, it, it's hard for me to see those organizations now as good guys. Well, that's a good point. Um, I, I did it because I didn't want it, the, the whole story to be dismissed. I, I wanted the people who were running those big five, the bingos, which 
really have driven global conservation uh, for the past mostly century. I, I did not want them to be seen by me um, as evil, wicked, horrible, racist uh, people. I want, wanted to see themselves as mistaken um, about their whole approach to conservation. And the reason I say they're good guys is because their basic mission is good, right? These, this isn't big mining, big timber, big ranching, um, you know, big oil, big anything. Um, it's big conservation. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, conservation is a good mission. So that's what I, when I say good guys, I meant these were a bunch of people who were trying to make the world um, safer for life, more biologically diverse, more ecologically healthy, however you want to word it. Um, their mission is good. So that's what I meant by good guys. Yeah. Um, did they drive a lot of people out of, out of uh, uh, their homelands? Absolutely. Absolutely. The protected areas of the planet, many, many of which once hosted enormous numbers of people, Cover, covers a landmass now larger than the entire continent of Africa. So um, that sounds very impressive. So you get IUCN saying uh, global conservation has protected a landmass the size of Africa. Yeah, well, look closely at what happened inside that landmass in the, pro in the process of doing it. So here were these good guys are going in trying to do something good and ended up doing something bad, right? They're you know, they they really didn't argue very much with my book or with, in fact, most of them now have hired anthropologists. Most of them now um, have started um, indigenous project, conservation projects. You know, Peter, Peter Seligman has actually left CI and started a, um, um, a native driven conservation group. Not very good. I think he's, he hasn't quite got it yet, but he's headed in the right direction. So, I mean, there are, um, there are people who realize that who are doing, a, doing something essentially good or trying to do something essentially good, who realize that they, it wasn't totally good and are now trying to make it better. So it's a slow process to take one of these. These are huge organizations that incidentally, all five of them are headquartered in Washington. Um, so they're essentially American or even the African Wildlife Federation, which sounds like an African organization is headquartered in that and um, in Washington, it is an American organization. So um, they're slowly but surely getting it, it you know, and they're, those are those organizations, if you really go inside and you look really, really closely at what their top executives, what their leadership is doing, what they're doing is trying to raise more money to keep going, right? So Peter Seligman is one of the greatest fundraisers I've ever seen working, um, but he really wasn't a very good conservationist, but he raised a billions of dollars to keep CI going and open 80 offices in 80 different countries around the world, blah, blah. Very impressive, but until you look at what they're doing or the totality of what they're doing. And you know, to have any global movement driven by five gigantic organizations is not really a good idea, particularly when you found out, I'm sure we're as an active conservationist, that the best conservation is local conservation. The best con conservation is done by people who are very, very familiar with the ecosystem they're trying to protect and very and, and are dependent on it, uh, if not for their food security, for a safe place to live, good air, clean water, et cetera. They get it. So I'm to me, the whole shift in conservation should be from you know, the bingos to a, a million uh, very, very small organizations uh, working inside their watershed. Um, you know, I, 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 the biggest funder of CI um, is Gordon Moore. Um, and Gordon Moore, um, you know, is the founder of Intel, made, made several billion dollars. Um, the story about how Pete Seligman found Gordon Moore and got him to put the largest single grant uh, into a, any conservation organization. It's a funny story. Um, but what's not funny um, is the fact that CI became the fifth big bingo, right? Spinning off from the others, doing the same damn thing. And what's interesting is that 
I think Gordon Moore, the funder, is starting was began to get religion before anybody else. Um, I had I had a uh, um, an imaginary lunch with Gordon Moore that was actually taped and videoed, um, and which you can get, and I think you can still get it on Grist. Um, where I was saying to Gordon Moore, this is an imaginary lunch, Gordon, um, you put five hundred million dollars into CI, that. That was a very generous grant and conservation is a good mission, good thing to fund. But if you had have just taken 100 of that 500 million and broken it up into 100 $1 million parts and given a million dollars to careful oh, to 100 carefully selected local conservation groups around the world working inside their own watershed, you would have got way more bangs for your buck. And he got it. He got it. He saw that. And he went right back to CI and said, you've got to put um, a high percentage of the money I'm giving you um, directly through your treasury into local conservation groups. So slowly but surely, you know, <laughs> these guys are getting in that case, the money got it. But sometimes um, it's the conservationists that get it. But usually it's the local it's the people who are working in the field who get it, who see the damage that that is being perpetrated by their headquarters in Washington, who are just trying to raise money. So um, the combination of these young anthropologists and wildlife biologists who are working in the field um, and the money are beginning to see that um, that global conservation that displaces a large number of people is not a good idea. Humans is back and better than ever with a slate of guests and topics that we can't wait to share with you. If you like the work that we do here on the show and want to support us so that we can keep bringing you the good stuff, head on over to patreon.com slash earth to humans. For as little as $1 a month, you can support the show in a big way. Patreon subscribers will get access to a range of exclusive ETH content, including our book club, author talks, archived episodes, merch, and more. That's patreon.com slash earth to humans for more information on how you can join this kick-ass community of nature loving weirdos. You sort of leave the book, the conservation refugees, that book off on you know, a, a somewhat hopeful note, right? Where like there's there's promise and there's change. And I mean, all these organizations were, were very quick to change their messaging and they've been much slower to change the actual, their actual practices, which is disheartening, but it's it's like there there is still progress and there are a handful of success stories. Well, that, I mean, Global conservation, a good analogy for global conservation is that ship that just got stuck in the uh, Suez Canal, right? I mean, here's an organization that is so big it can't turn around. Um, and when it tries to turn around or whatever, it gets stuck and it blocks up everything else um, that's trying to get 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 to the goal, right? Um, so it's that's a good analogy, that, that, that ship that got stuck in the Gulf for global conservation. It's really slow. I, the last... The last country I focused on in conservation refugees was Gabon, um, because at the time um, it was showing some promise, and and that the the bingos that were working in Gabon were realizing that they had a natural model there um, and an opportunity to do it right. I have to say, looking back on it, I mean, I'm watching it since they haven't really pulled it off yet, um, but um, I think they were right to realize that 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 was a country where you could try and establish a new model for conservation that included native people. If we're using, you know, your sort of example of, um, you know, conservation as this, this massive ship that's stuck in the Suez Canal and it, it, it can't turn around, right? Like it's just stuck there. And when it gets unstuck, it just keeps moving forward, even like slower than it was before, right? It's like, like, can this turn around? Like, is there, like, there are people at 
Conservation International and these other organizations that that absolutely like recognize what's going on and recognize the importance of working with indigenous communities and indigenous nations now, right? But there's still going to be these obstacles associated with with funding and you know the the executives that that run these organizations from Washington D.C. Like, is is anybody? within these organizations, like speaking out saying like, maybe we just got to break them up, right? It's like, we got to break up all the tech companies. We got to break up all the big transnational and conservation NGOs. That's, uh, that's well, that's how the bingos happen, really. I mean, you know, there was, there was the, the Wolf Wolf, the World Wildlife Foundation, and then, then there was Nature Conservancy, and then there was CI, and then there was the African Wildlife. So it's kind of a consequence of slow breakup. Um, the problem with, I mean, the, the, the ship analogy is good because once they broke it loose, it start it just kept going in the same direction. Well, that that is what what is happening in conservation now. You know, it gets stuck for a while. People are yelling and screaming. You know why you got stuck? You got stuck because you're screwing it up and everything. And they said, "Oh, we're unstuck," and they keep moving in the same direction. Um, if they could have pulled it around and got it headed in the in the opposite direction. Um, it might have been better. I don't know, but but it certainly would have been in conservation if if they uh, uh, you know handed back and reconsidered a lot of the programs that they've they've started um, worldwide. It would it it would help. Um, so that was you're right about that. It's really really difficult to uh, reform something that is that big and that concentrated, um, particularly when there's still lots of people inside the organization who don't agree with. The premise of conservation refugees, um, and a lot of people in there who don't even know what the organization is doing. All they they know is that they got to raise a lot of money to keep it going. One of the things that you write extensively about, both in in, in both conservation refugees and and your most recent book, the the Haida Gwaii lesson, is the significance of the UN's work on crafting these messages about the rights of indigenous people, right? There are, there are certainly people within the UN, right, who played a role in crafting that declaration and who are still heavily involved in, in these working groups and these committees that are, are very aware of this, the full scope of this situation. Like, could, could you imagine anything like coming out of that, in, you know, moving forward into the future where there's you know, like a, a UN initiative to to try to encourage these big transnational NGOs to like to to split up. Well, if you read the uh, uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People um, carefully, with with what you and I are talking about in mind, um, you can see that. That what was violated in this process over the, the, the century that, that 20 million people were evicted from their land uh, was not just title and land rights, um, but basic human rights for indigenous people. And that is what the declaration is saying. So the declaration, which remember is only a declaration, it's not enforceable, but, but that declaration can be used um, as, and has been as a document um, to fight what you and I are talking about, the displacement of people in the interest of, of conservation. Um, so it's, a, it's an important document in the struggle as it is an important document in the struggle for title, sovereignty and everything else that um, indigenous people and native people around the world are struggling for. Um, I mean, hundreds of way, way, way more First Nations in the world are struggling for sovereignty than established nations. Um, in, um, in, in, the, in the map of the world. I'm curious, you know, you, you touched on this briefly, but, but I'm curious to hear more about um, the reaction that your book, Conservation Refugees, got up, upon being published. Um, you know, specifically reactions from, from folks within the conservation movement, environmental movement. Well, the leadership, um, I mean, I can quote Russ Mittermeier, who was the president of CI, um, at the time, the the um, Seligman was the chairman and CEO, very corporate, right? <laughs> chairman and CEO, and Russ Mittermeier was the president. Russ Mittermeier described me as a gigantic pain in the ass. Those were his words. Um, and uh, so, I, I mean, 
you know, that's I, I, I wasn't personally offended by that. I've been called much worse things by uh, much worse people. But um, so and I think but but at the at the top and, you know, I went after the salaries of some of these people. I went after the, um, you know, n nothing personal, but just some of the the history and everything. So that the, the leadership weren't too happy. But I do know that a lot of the people I met along the way in the field um, and that were working you know, below the executive level of the organizations, we're very happy uh, with the book and, and glad that it was published and glad that it focused on something that they had sort of sensed was wrong. Um, again, remember the people in the field, um, in, in, you know, it doesn't matter whether it's in the Vilcabamba, um, in the Andes or in the heart of Africa or wherever it is, they see the consequences. They see Native people struggling uh, for food security. They see Native people poaching um, off the what used to be their own land and what is now um, a national park um, or uh, some other form of public land. They see it um, and they, they confront people and they understand it. Now, some of them have reacted badly. World Wildlife Fund is funding... Um, the anti-poacher killers um, in, in Africa. And, and they're actually killing people who are poaching um, in public land and, and in, in uh, Wolf Wolf protected land, wildlife uh, protected land, um, simply for food security. It's the only way they get protein um, is, is to go in and hunt in the forest. Um, and they're being killed by uh, paid anti-poachers. And some of them are being paid for uh, by Wolf Wolf, by the World Wildlife Fund. Um, that's I didn't do I didn't do that story, but someone else did. Um, it was a good piece of investigative work. Uh, it's a continuation of the same story, really. Um, so it's not done yet. It's not over yet, and uh, uh, I think it's going to take uh, probably within your lifetime, and not within mine, <laughs> that it'll, it'll, this problem will be solved. But, you know, it's it's directly, uh, Matt, connected to um, what what I found in the Haida Gwaii lesson, which is, was incidentally, you were asking me earlier um, how I find these stories. Um, the Haida Gwaii lesson came from my being asked, um, I think, on every continent, um, many, many times by uh, indigenous leaders, their lawyers, um, their shaman, um, their w wisdom keepers, whatever you call them. Do you know about the Haida? And um, they kept asking about the Haida. The, the Haida, I mean, the story that I told in that book was well known around the world by indigenous people because the Haida took 50 years committed to uh, retaining the title they believe they've always had for the 12,000 years they've been on their land um, and the sovereignty they believe they, they never lost, uh, but did. Um, and so they took 50 years um, to get it back and they won. But it, so it's a, the, the, the Haida Gwaii lesson is the lesson that the Haida Gwaii have to teach um, other native people about how to uh, regain the title they lost over their land and regain uh, the sovereignty that they lost um, to the imperial forces of Europe, um, which took about a century, <laughs> coincidentally. Um, and um, so I went I went up to Haida Gwaii and I, I took a look at it based just on that question that was asked repeatedly, do you know the Haida? Do you know about the Haida? And I would say, why do you want to know if I know about the Haida? And they'd say, because we want what they have. So I went up and found out how, what they had and how they got it and turned it into a, uh, as the subtitle of the book says, a strategic playbook uh, for indigenous sovereignty. And that's all I intended it to be, which is interesting. Um, I thought I'd sell maybe 300 copies of that book, which is the number of lawyers in the world who are actually litigating on, the, on behalf of native people around the world. I thought they'd all buy the book and that would be it, but oh, it's done really well. You've got it. <laughs> I Yep, I've got a copy um, and it's fascinating. Um, I mean, and 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 it's not and it's not just the story of the Haida, right? It's 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 you you sort of start off with some background information, um, some natural history, 
history of of the Haida, and then you delve into this like really in depth like legal history, right? Like history of the legal justification of how not just the Haida, but like how all indigenous people ended up, you know, like losing sovereignty over their lands, right? Yeah, the, the doctrine of discovery, um, which was issued by the Pope, um, who was a corrupt Borgia, um, who named himself Alex, Pope Alexander VI. And he issued the, uh, a thing called the doctrine of discovery, um, which he gave to the King and Queen of Spain um, granting them permission, basically, um, to uh, to take control, title, and sovereignty of any land that they found or discovered anywhere in the world. Um, so, and that doctrine, incidentally, is still occasionally cited um, in litigation um, as um, as evidence that uh, the people who are claiming they own the land. Um, the natives really don't. Um, that 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 the doctrine of discovery put it into the control of what it were the imperial forces of Europe. Um, so if you discovered it, you owned it. Um, didn't matter who was living on it. Didn't matter who'd been there for thirteen thousand years. Yeah, if you discovered it and you were of European, either Portuguese or Spanish, you owned it. So that's that is still to some degree the legal background um, that that people fighting for sovereignty and title are up against um, because it still is a legal doctrine, the doctrine of discovery. I mean, the United States Supreme Court um, at, since the founding of America has cited the doctrine of discovery um, as a, uh, a, a, a doctrine protecting um, the, the national ownership of what used to be native land. Um, so that, you're right. I mean, it, the legal, the legal, the, the legal history, um, it was important. It was important for the Haida to understand it. I, one of the other thing I did for this was I went and got every, every petition, legal petition that I could read. Some of them have never been uh, uh, translated into English or Spanish or French. But so if, if they weren't, I can't read them. Um, anyone, but all the ones I re could read, and I synthesized them in a book there, in a chapter in that book called The Argument, which is just basically the generic argument that any Native people anywhere in the world can use uh, in, in their struggle for sovereignty and title. Um, and that, I think that's probably, in terms of the, the, the Native people around the world, that's the most popular chapter um, in the book. It's short, um, it's generic, and it is just the essential argument. Um, for title. Yeah. And, uh, you know, one of the things, and, and right, that's a part of this, this, this idea of the book, that it is a strategic playbook for indigenous sovereignty. Um, one of the aspects about this that was really deeply fascinating to me is, you know, you're, you're in, in your writing, you're, you're, you're presenting this as, you know, this is a, this is a strategy, a strategic playbook. Right. And, and so you're, you're talking about like what the Haida did correctly um that you know led to their success in in gaining their their sovereignty back or re-acknowledging that that sovereignty was always there right um and you know you you talk before you dive into like this th these things you're talking about right the argument and 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 the history of you know the legal justification of taking away sovereignty from all of these indigenous nations all over the world, um, you know, you explain that like this information, this information I'm about to share with you is a part of the strategy and that the Haida knew this, right? Like you're not, you're not writing this down for the Haida, right? Um, you're trying to express to other indigenous people and indigenous nations that like this was one of the things that the Haida did right is they learned all about this history. Um, and you know, one of the other things you talk about is how the name of Chief Tanaya, who was the chief of the Awanichis in Yosemite in 1851, um, when the Mariposa Battalion, you know, uh, came in to do their their raid, um, that like 
Chief Tanaya is known to indigenous people all across the globe, right? Whereas that's a name that virtually no people of European ancestry and certainly in the United States would have any idea who that person is. So I, you know, I, I just, I wonder if you can talk about like this difference in like knowledge and, and, and education and like the assumptions that, that come along with that in our Western society as compared to indigenous communities. So what you're looking at is about 6,500 separate communities, many of which speak a language that has never been put into writing, many of which uh, only speak that language, and many of those languages are dying out, um, managed to put together a global movement for indigenous rights that ended up, of course, had, amongst other things, with the UN Declaration on the, on the Rights of Indigenous People, but many, many other things. So the bottom line, I think what, what, what the Haida has taught the world is patience and timing. So you, you're not going to win a big, big struggle for something as significant as sovereignty and title um, in one showdown. It's going to take a long time, and it's going to take lining up all your tactics, getting your wise people together, deciding which is one should be used first or tried first, et cetera, and then patiently trying them one after the other and relying on your sense and your historical knowledge of what works better first. So do you do your media campaign before you do your demonstration? Or do you do your demonstration before you do your court campaign? Or do you, um, or do you send five of your best students to law school so you have native lawyers in your community? I mean, these are all part of the very slow, patient um, collection of tactics that, ter- that end up uh, becoming your total campaign for whatever you're struggling for. And that's, that's what the, the Haida mastered. And sure, they made some mistakes. But when they did, they spun back to before they made the mistake and started over again. Said, we shouldn't have gone to the media before we went to the Capitol. We should have gone to the Capitol first and then go to the media, right? Now, so let's do it again. That's why it took 50 years, right? Because they made mistakes, respun the thing, reordered the tactics, and went back and finally got it right. So... Another document that's important in that book is the chronology in the back, which is an appendix to the book, because that gives the reader of the book the order that the tactics were used by the Haida to accomplish sovereignty and title. So that's a long answer to a short question. (laughs) No, that's great, though. Um, So you wrote this book with participation and active communication with the Haida nation. Like, what did that negotiation process looked like or, or you know uh, uh, when when you approach you know representatives from from the Haida nation with this idea for writing a book I, I had I'd been working quite a bit with Orion magazine which you may read and um, they had committed to doing something on the Haida uh, having me do something on the Haida we we had trouble raising money for it because um, you know I, it involved requiring me to go up there and spend quite a bit of time and research. And it just sort of drifted my editor at, at Orion left. Um, and um, so, no, but then she eventually went to work for a book publishing company, which is the, the company that published the Haida Gwaii Lesson. And she said, let's do it. Um, uh, I want to bring you into this new, uh, new publishing company. Let's do it. Uh, and I said, okay. And, we, and I went out and raised the money um, um, to do it. I, I think that I'm, I'm trying to remember here, Matt, the, the first Haida's that I spoke to and set up interviews w- was through people that we knew in common. So I know people who had worked with them, people with the Lannan Foundation in New Mexico, um, people, um, lawyers in Vancouver, where I lived for a while, um, who'd worked with them. And so I, I, I contacted people who knew the Haida because there was a book published before mine about the Haida, uh, a book called All That We Have, All That We Know Is Ours. And it was a, 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 an attempt to do the same thing as I was doing, but not as a strategic playbook, just as a history. And the Haida hated that book, and they still do, uh, because the guy that did it, who was an Australian, a conservationist, incidentally, an Australian, um, he 
Um, he insulted them. You know, Native people are very wary of us uh, for very good reason. Um, and so I can't just walk in to, you know, get off a, 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 a ferry in, in, in Haida Gwaii and walk in there and say, hey, I'm going to do a story about how you guys won sovereignty and title. Um, you got to go in very, very cautiously through people they trust. So I actually went up. They have a lawyer who lives in a little town south of Vancouver uh, who is Haida. And I, I spent a lot of time with her before I went anywhere near Haida Gwaii interviewing her. She, she represented them at the, Cal at the uh, Canadian Supreme Court, um, which was a very, very important decision. Um, and she was used to talking to media, used to being um, interviewed by reporters. And um, I got her to trust me. And, and then I said, would you introduce me to, and I started naming people who were their, you know, their, their leaders and their, their shaman and their wise people and their uh, tribal chieftains and their uh, her hereditary chiefs, et cetera. And so slowly but surely she set up um, introductions for me. And when, when I had about a dozen, um, I was, I felt safe and comfortable going in there and meeting people that she had introduced me to. So it's, you know, uh, it's a it's a different approach to reporting. It's a different approach to uh, approach to research. Um, you just have to be like they are patient um, and respectful. I mean, they have a word um, in in their language. I, I I can't remember it actually. It's in the book, and basically, it's they say it's the most important word in their language, and it translates into English as the word respect. And um, but they, it, for them, it's global. The word respect it's respect it's respect for the creator it's respect for the creation it's respect for all people it's respect for the land it's respect for the water respect for the animals it's respect you, you, you if you respect everything that needs to be respected um you'll get along in the world and get along in nature and get along in your ecosystem so um it's a long word their word uh begins with a k that's all i can remember but um it means respect. So they expect respect and they respect themselves. So um, that was the message I had. And I think that paid off. The Australian guy that went in there, I don't think he was disrespectful, but he didn't understand the Haida concept of respect. Um, and they don't like his book. I don't, I actually did like his book. <laughs> uh, and, and of course, I got together with him, too, because... Um, you know, one of the things journalists do is um, if, if they're going into a story that has already been covered by other journalists, you want to talk to, to those journalists about who will talk to you, who won't, who's good, who's bad, you know. So I was briefed by Ian Gill, the guy who wrote that book, um, and he and I got along, but, you know, we're a couple of cocky white boys. So... Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so what what was it like when, when you actually got to Haida Gwaii? I was surprised at how unfriendly the old people were and how friendly the young people were. And it wasn't unfriendly. It was mistrusting for a very good reason, right? They, they weren't unfriendly to me. I shouldn't use that word. They just, they were aware. Here's another white guy. You know, I mean, and I've been covering this for long enough, Matt, that I've, I'm used to have people saying, hey, you're, you're just another journalist who's coming in here stealing our story and selling it to make a living. And we're tired of it, right? We're tired of having our story stolen. And so the older, the old timers who've had their so up in Haida Gwaii, who've had their story stolen um, by anthropologists, by journalists, by historians, by religious leaders, um, and who leave the island and go make money on it, pisses them off, right? So um, I, I caught that, but I expected it because I've been covering indigenous tissues for a long time. But the young ones, uh, the young ones, they want the world to know who they are. Uh, they want to, they want to borrow the best that they possibly can from the modern world and stay on the islands, which are beautiful. You say, and I, I mean, I've, I've certainly experienced this as well, and it's a, a completely justified, right, of this, you know, hesitancy to put trust in someone like yourself. 
you went in there with the strategy and, 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 and a pitch, right? I mean, it's you're, you're like, I'm, I don't want, want to just write some story and just do a history. Like I want to make a strategic playbook that's going to benefit all these other indigenous communities all over the world. Right. Like how easy was it to, to make that pitch? And like, was there a moment where you're like, I'm in, like, I got it. I, I, I gained trust. Well, the high didn't know what they pulled off. They know that, and they, they're part of this global movement for indigenous rights. They turn up at all these conferences and they heard the same question that I heard. And they heard the same sentiment that I heard. We want what you guys have, teach us how to do it. And uh, you know, the, pre the former president of the Haida uh, nation, um, a guy named Gucha, um, he travels the world teaching people how to do this. Um, so I went in and I told them, just what I told you. I said, there are people all over the world who want this documented in a way that they can use it as a strategic playbook. Will you help me do it? And if, when I put it that way, they said, sure. Yeah, I'm sure. Um, so they, they were very, very glad and very honored and flattered that what they pulled off could be of use to people all over the world. Um, and that somebody wanted to make it of use to people all over the world. So yeah, um, if I put it that way, um, they were they were happy to talk um, and happy to help me and happy to show me the documents and happy to introduce me to their lawyers and other people off the islands that helped them um, win what they won. So yeah, but the approach is <laughs> the approach is always um, you know with people who've been screwed over one way or another for centuries. The way you approach them is very, uh, particularly if you're a white person with European background, the way you approach them is absolutely vital. As we wrap up this episode, I'll add one final encouragement for folks to join our new Earth to Humans book club. If you enjoyed today's conversation with author Mark Dowie, I'd highly recommend that you read his most recent book, The Haida Gwaii Lesson. And we'll send you a digital copy of this book if you sign up for our book club via Patreon for just $1 a month. Check out our show notes page for more details and to sign up. Those show notes can be found at wildlensinc.org slash eth230. That's wildlensinc.org slash eth230. Earth to Humans is a production of the Wild Lens Collective. The show is produced every other week by Serena Simons, Hannah Mulvaney, and myself, your co-host for today's episode, Matt Podolsky. We are now on Instagram at Earth to Humans Pod. Our intro sequence features audio recordings from the Macaulay Library at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, and music featured in today's episode comes from Blue Dot Sessions.